All right, hey, what's going on, folks? Dr. Kevin Jefferson here, chair of the Podiatric Medicine and Surgery Section of the National Medical Association. We appreciate you joining us here in this conversation. I'm honored to be joined by one of our board members in the podiatry section, Dr. Al Glover, out in Los Angeles, California. We're having a conversation today about being a military podiatrist. Uh, Dr. Glover was in the Navy as a podiatrist and then transitioned to civilian life. So we're going to be talking about all that good kind of good stuff. Uh, Al, Dr. Glover, first of all, uh, thank you for joining us. I know, you know, it's three hour difference. So I appreciate you getting up a little early to be with me today. Would you go ahead and take an opportunity to, to let us know a little bit more about yourself? Thank you so much, Dr. Jefferson. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about uh, my experience as a Navy podiatrist. Uh, I think first and foremost, I'm I'm an Army brat. So uh, I was born in Anchorage, Alaska, and had an opportunity to travel pretty much throughout the world um, with my dad and during his career. Um, I went to the Ohio School uh, of Podiatric Medicine, now Kent State University, after graduating from University of San Francisco here in California. And when I went to residency, um, First and foremost, there weren't a lot of residency programs, and I went to a one-year program in Norfolk, uh, Virginia, Norfolk Community Hospital. Um, it was a one-year program, and I thought it was pretty solid. We, we got uh, a lot of good surgical and didactic training, but I really wanted to do more. And because I was in Norfolk, and because I had a military background, I had a chance to meet some of the podiatrists that were at the Portsmouth uh, Naval Hospital in Virginia. So what happened was I applied, I got in, and part of what they do in the military is you have to do what they call officer indoctrination uh, if you didn't do ROTC or something like that. So I had an opportunity to go to Newport, Rhode Island, which was, it was phenomenal. I went there, we spent uh, uh, 10 weeks, you know, going through uh, military protocol history, um, you know, getting us kind of prepared to be naval officers. We had uh, all types of uh, uh, specialties uh, medically. We had attorneys. We had all the professional uh, uh, individuals who were going to come in as officers. So once I finished that and uh, didn't know where I was going to go, and I was chosen to go to Great Lakes Naval Hospital, outside of uh, Chicago, Illinois. And even though initially I was uh, a little disappointed because I really didn't want to go to the coal, but what it ended up being was one of the best uh, opportunities I ever had. At the time, uh, we had a residency program uh, at the Great Lakes Naval Hospital. So I had a chance to do two additional years there um, at Great Lakes and then what I, I had a chance to do, because we had a large group of podiatrists, we were able to get uh, our cases for our boards within a real short period of time. And one of the things that we did, which I, I wish they would continue to do, is we identified different large uh, military uh, facilities or medical centers that did specific things. And we partnered with them. We did MOUs with them. So we all had a chance to spend three months down at Fort uh, Benning, uh, Georgia. So we had a chance to get all those ankles in. And um, and that was you know quite a quite an experience. Then we had a chance to go to Wilford Hall uh, Air Force uh, uh, Medical Center in San Antonio, and we had a chance to to do cave, there was a, a Dr. Morin who was really specialized in doing cavus foot. And then of course they also had the burn center. So we had a chance to experience that for an additional three months. And then we came out to the West Coast to Balboa Naval Hospital where we had a chance to get uh, a little bit more training and we had a chance to be a part of the Baja project. So we went down to Central America and we had a chance to at least assist didn't do, but we assisted on a couple of the club foot procedures. So it was it was a a, a pretty uh, rich experience. Um, got our cases within a couple of years, 
And at the time, the uh, board certification exam was done in Chicago. Uh, matter of fact, it was done there for a number of years. So uh, I was able to do pretty well. Um, and then I was actually able to be an examiner uh, with the uh, College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. So and I did that for 14 years. So I was an oral examiner. And that was a, a pretty good experience, you know, because what it did was it keeps you sharp. But I felt it was my job to try to make sure people could get through the process, unlike a lot of other individuals. But uh, going back to the military experience, uh, spent three years at Great Lakes Naval Hospital. Excellent opportunity. Then I went to Corpus Christi Naval Hospital um, in South Texas. And that was a real good experience because I was running my own show, uh, was embedded with a couple of orthopedic surgeons, and I was allowed to do pretty much everything I needed to do. Uh, at that time, I had a chance to come up and spend some time with Dr. Harkless, who was at uh, UT San Antonio, and do lectures and be a part of what he was doing with some of his fellows and had some of the fellows come down and spend time with me uh, so that they could get some experience. So we were kind of like an adjunct uh, location. So that was excellent. And then after or during my time when I was at uh, Corpus, Corpus Christi Naval Hospital, um, it was during Desert Storm. So um, I was uh, assigned to uh, Kuwait. Uh, initially, I was on the USS Saipan, which is a... Um, uh, a destroyer, um, but then soon was able to deploy um, in Kuwait uh, with some of the, what we call uh, hospital units uh, that were all tri-service combined. I did not have an opportunity to get on uh, either the Comfort um, or the Mercy, which are the, the Naval's uh, uh, hospital ships. Had a chance to just kind of tour it, but only the big dogs got on that. Uh, we were in a little small uh, uh, area, but what happened was they thought they were putting podiatrists off to the side, but we were put in one of the coolest uh, 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 tent complexes. And I was amazed at how many people were coming uh, to see us. You know, everybody had a foot problem. Now, what what I, I guess learned later on, you know, I was all extremely excited thinking they were coming to see me, but they wanted to get in the cool area. And that was the excuse to do it. But it it was a it was a tremendous experience, and I really um, after that I got out uh, of the Navy uh, after being down at Buford Naval Hospital, and I was in South Carolina, so um, it was natural. I bought a practice down in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and practiced there for almost uh, seven and a half years, um, and then ultimately I came back to California, where I'm from. My dad retired at. Uh, Fort Ord Naval Hospital and uh, wanted to be closer to my parents who were getting older, um, you know, different things like that. But but getting back to the military experience, one of the things we didn't have during my time, we didn't have the loan forgiveness, but now we have that. It's something we fought for during my whole time on active duty. But now uh, the Navy or any of the, the, the services if you get in as a podiatrist, you will definitely be put on their loan forgiveness program. And I believe if you serve five years, um, but now I know loans are different, you pretty much can knock out, you know, all of your loans, which are, I think would be very significant. The other thing is it's very difficult. I didn't realize this until I got out of private practice, how difficult it was to get cases when you're going from hospital to hospital and surgery center to surgery center. When I was on active duty, I had a chance to just tell my corpsman, you know, this, this case, go ahead and give me x-rays, give me MRIs, copy everything. So it was like, it was one, two, three. All I had to do was snap my fingers and everything was sent. Uh, the, the ability to be able to get the exposure you need, uh, to fast track your board certification, um, and really to have a chance to really be the captain of your own ship early on. Uh, I'm amazed, even to this day, the kind of responsibilities that they put on young people uh, when you come into the military. Uh, you're, you're in charge of the hospital. You know, some of the, 
the different ancillary duties we had to do is we were uh, officers of the weekend. So we had to be in charge. So if somebody died or anything happened, we were the ones running the show. And we had to do a whole bunch of, uh, you know, paperwork and, and stuff like that. But, but we had to make sure that we had a lot of uh, ancillary, you know, uh, jobs and expertise, you know, and that's just part of life. The other thing I thought was really good is we had a chance to go to San Antonio and they have the, um, uh, not the ACLS, but the TC, uh, TCLS, you know, the, the trauma component to that. And during that time, and, you know, it was controversial, we had a chance to work on goats that were shot in the hindquarters with uh, M16 round and we had to do emergency debridements. Uh, we had to start a line. All this stuff was leading up to what we thought we were going to do uh, in Desert Storm. But ultimately, uh, because it didn't last that long, we spent more time preparing for that uh, uh, conflict than how I think it lasted for like 72 hours. But that was just kind of the, the experiences that, you know, just, just some of the the experiences I had. And I really would love to see more, you know, African-American um, do docs consider the military. Uh, I was there during the golden era. We had six uh, African-American uh, docs uh, that were in the United States Navy, you know, uh, we, and I think we were kind of responsible for trying to, to push the envelope to say, listen, these people are qualified. And if you feel, you know, hey, I want to do extra work. You know, a lot of people do the fellowships, which are which I think is great. But I think this is a good adjunct to the fellowship because you'll have a chance to really um, hydro drive your, you know, your experience, your expertise um, in all kinds of pathology and things of that nature. So it's something to think about. Man, I, I, I get it, man. I was in, in the Army Reserves for eight years from 90 to uh 98 just before uh desert storm kicked off or desert shield actually uh kicked off i was at uh i was i was in basic at fort sill in oklahoma when the when the first shots were fired and then i did training also at fort sam houston in san antonio texas and then i was at uh fitzsimmons army medical center in aurora colorado so i got to see a lot of stuff man i got to work with a lot of great doctors, a lot of great podiatrists uh, in the military. And in the military, everybody's position is important. Yes, there's rank, from buck private all the way up to, you know, four-star general. But in particular arenas, your rank really doesn't matter if you have a particular knowledge base or skill, right? I remember we were always taught by our drill sergeants that if you're out on patrol and there's... Uh, a PFC, a private first class that can work this particular piece of, of equipment better than better than an E6, uh, a staff sergeant, then guess who's going to have that duty? That soldier who can work it. And the same thing in military medicine, right? So if there's a podiatrist who can work this case, has better skill at this particular type of issue than the orthopedic surgeon, then guess who's going to guess who's going to get it? They're, they're, podi they're podiatrists in the military that are running units. Yeah. Right. Am, am, am I wrong? You're absolutely right. And the thing is, like you said, because we had so much. So, you know, the mission was taking care of the patients. And if you could do an ankle better. And when guys started coming back from training from from uh, Fort Benning uh, and Fort Bragg. They said, hey, listen, you guys are doing these, man, you know, so. They, you know, it's about mission. And the other thing too, what I loved is when I hit Great Lakes, you know, we had to do everything. They made us work with the, the corpsmen who were uh, prepping the rooms and we had to stay with them for a month. We stayed with the sterilization crew. We stayed with them a month and we had to get to understand what they were doing. And it really built teamwork. And it wasn't like, you know, I'm yelling at them. No, because, see, it, they did not allow that. We had a couple of civilian docs that we tried to do that, and they, and they were pretty much, uh, you know, dismissed. Because when you're in a military situation, you've got to utilize everybody's talent, like Dr. Jefferson said. 
and you don't have time to play games. You don't have time to play games and you want the best. And you also want to encourage. One of the good things that I feel very proud of, excuse me, is six of my corpsmen that were with me at Great Lakes or in Corpus uh, later went on to medical school. We allowed them to, to do their college stuff while they, we were working with them. But we really encouraged them. One went to pediatric school and the other three went to uh, uh, medical school. But I felt really good about that because I wanted to uh, have an attitude of encouragement. Because I, I would tell the guys, man, you know, I have them, you know, because because we were seeing so many patients. I had had my guys, they were doing the clothes. You know, if a guy was competent, boom. And the reason why I was doing that, letting them close, let them close in layers, is because when they get deployed, they are the only ones. And what we didn't have for a long time is on a sub, all we had were corpsmen and what we call independent duty corps, uh, 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 independent, independent duty corpsmen, which I think is equivalent to like a PA. And those guys were down six months, nine months at a time. If you needed an appendectomy or anything else, they don't come up. So you were it. So it was really important for us to cross train as many of our our young people as we could, because we knew that they may be put in a situation that they're going to be the only ones there. So we were constantly encouraging them, constantly, you know, letting them feel empowered. And then I think because of that, I think they had the confidence to go on and do great things, you know, later on after they got out of the military. Uh, well, uh, one, one quick story, man. I, I have one of my um, uh, commanders in my, in my unit. My unit was the 344th uh, General Hospital based out of uh, Queens, New York. And when he was deployed uh, to Kuwait, there were days when there were only two surgeons, two surgeons that particular field hospital. We, we were a field hospital as, as, as well. We did what's called deployable medical systems, right? And there were times where there was only two of them. One was an orthopedic surgeon and the podiatrist. And, when, and sometimes cases are going on concurrently. You don't have time to just run one room. So and a lot of times in the, in the wartime situation, the, the primary surgery is to stabilize and then move that particular patient, that, that soldier, that airman, that sailor, to somewhere else to have more work done. All right, so in this case, the orthopedist, the way they des decided to divide it up is that the orthopedist did everything from the waist up, the podiatrist did everything from the waist down. So, so being well-rounded not only makes you uh, a, a better doctor, but it makes you vital to the mission. Because you have to learn. You have to know everything. And it's, it, it's, it's not a joke. I don't say that, uh, you know, just to be bragging about what we do in the military, but you have to know it. And, and, and when, when we were doing exercises uh, in, in my unit, my primary responsibility was I was an OR technician, right? But in the OR, as, as, you, would, as you were saying, if you can do such and such procedure or be, such and such technique better than somebody else you did it, or the, the primary surgeon would finish, you know, the dirty work, and you would come in and finish the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. As a podiatrist, hips, knees, elbows, shoulders, whatever needs to be done. Hey, you're a surgeon, right? Yeah. What are you, podiatrist? Good. You know how to sew something up. Here, go fix that. I'll see you in an hour. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's <laughs> it. And then and then you had the confidence with your guys. See, mm -hmm. once you got things stabilized, boom, boom, okay, got to this layer. You got it? No problem, Doc. And then they're, boom, they're closing. They're, you know, they're closing the two layers. And yeah. then you move on. You're going to the next OR or you're trying to stabilize the next, you know, uh, you know, patient. So absolutely right. 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 And I want you to talk a little bit more, if you could, about because of these experiences, you were able to get leadership positions in units or, or in sections that's much more difficult to do for podiatrists on the civilian side. Absolutely. Um, because of this, we were, were put in a position where we could be um, in command of, of, of not only units, but of departments. Um, you know, as people became more comfortable, uh, it was, it was, it, it wasn't even a thing, it, you know, you're, you're, you're brought into the command, you know, medical, uh, meetings, the Admiral, you know, is looking at you as one of the team and, 
when you can do the job and 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 they know you do it competently, you know, they'll put you in charge. I was put in charge of pretty much half of the hospital because they knew that I could get the job done. I knew what to do. I knew how to do it. And that, you know, gave me a lot of confidence that that you carry with you throughout your life. Fantastic, man. Then there's the the part I, that's very important because you alluded to it a, a, a little while ago is that transition from military life to civilian life because it, it happens to everybody that's in the military unless they become lifers right no matter what their military specialty uh was whether it be, whether they be truck drivers or what have you uh you know like the, the guy who became the white the brother that became the white house chef right he was a, i believe he was a navy chef right yeah, the, 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 the the big muscle brown brother that became obama chef all right so you know there's transitions you ha we have to make so tell me about what your experience was like going from that a much more structured where you, you where you're given a lot more leeway and leadership and all that other kind of stuff to transfer into uh, uh, civilian life into civilian podiatry practice it, it, it was a uh, it was quite a transition um i was at buford naval hospital and so i was in south carolina i had south carolina roots so I thought, you know, I'd like to practice in South Carolina. We only had, I think, one um, or two other African-American podiatrists in the state. And um, South Carolina, along with North Carolina, were notorious for rejecting people for no reason. And I think what I did was when I was still on active duty, I went to my local uh, congressperson in uniform and I told her that hey I'd like to you know I'd like to practice here in South Carolina and of course that was positive and then of course when I went to take my exam I had my uniform on um and I did that because I was pretty much told that that was going to be the the turning point because the good old boys will talk about a lot of stuff but they won't talk you know, negatively of the military. So that was, you know, more strategic, uh, but it did work. But the thing that I really realized early on in a Southern town where I'm one of, you know, two other blacks on a, on a hospital staff and being invited out with a Jewish doctor and his wife. Um, and they told myself and my wife that uh, he was the only Jewish doctor in the hospital, which kind of blew me away. And of course, there was only one other um, African-American doc. So I said, okay, so it was a good old boy country. But the only thing that saved me when I opened up my practice, because we, you know, you heard things. I purchased it from uh, a gentleman who was Caucasian. So people would call and say, you know, is this the practice that, you know, and, and say negative things. Um, but the thing that saved me was we had a couple of military surgeons that had been in the military, different branches. And when I had a first couple of cases, they came in and we talk. I didn't realize what they were doing because they were saying, hey, I want to come in. So they came in, I'm doing stuff. And, and they saw the skill level. They knew the skill level would be good, but they saw the skill level. And then the OR people, a lot of them were, you know, former military. And that kind of saved me. But the, the hardest transition, though, for me, even with all the racial stuff, was I was used to having control of my patients in the Navy. And the average age of our patients were sort of 21 years old that we were doing a lot of these complicated procedures on. And then I get out in the real world and I'm dealing with a lot of people with comorbidities and then people who I couldn't control. I mean, you know, when I did, a, you know, a lapidus or, or something like that or a flat foot procedure, I could put the military gentleman or lady in what we call med hole. You know, and I keep them there for three or four weeks and pretty much order them to stay off their feet. Couldn't do that. So I learned real quickly that. A lot of the real complicated procedures that I performed while I was in the military, I had to dial it back. I had to dial it back because, you know, I couldn't control a lot of the uh, 
elements that I could control previously. People didn't heal the same. So that was kind of the big thing to understand. And then, of course, the litigious aspect of it, uh, the aspect of people coming in, even back then, uh, wanting opiates, you know, for, for you know, no unknown reason. But I didn't realize that, you know, it was pretty much a crisis in, in a lot of the rural communities. So that was kind of one of the bigger things that I had to deal with. It was harder, but then once I kind of got used to it, and knew what time it was, then I was able to make the kind of transition. So um, how do you feel in general about how your military experience has prepared you for the way we do medicine now in 2023 versus, you know, when you first got out? Because there's been, there's been a whole lot of transition, a whole lot of changes in the past, just five years alone, shoot. A tremendous amount of change. Huh. I think what it has done is that as when I was in the military, you learn how to uh, compartmentalize, uh, meaning that there are certain things that you can and can't do. Um, and you have to be able to realize um, that fact. Uh, now, because I'm in the the latter part of my career, I don't do uh, that much surgery like I used to. Now, it's not that I didn't want to do a lot of surgery, but what happened was, and you start talking about five, 10 years ago, the paradigm of, of reimbursement has changed, you know, drastically. You know, I always laugh when I see guys talk about doing the uh, uh, lapoplasty, you know, uh, lapidus uh, procedures. And you know, I presented that to my surgery center and they said, well, doc, it's going to cost more for the device than it is that, you know, we're going to get from the facility fee. So the realities and, and being able to deal with the realities, but the one thing I think the military helped me was I had to constantly pivot to different jobs and be able to be competent with that and have a smooth transition. So that's what I've been able to do. I pivot to different things. I do more wound care now. Um, I do more administrative stuff now. Um, I'm not uh, just stuck uh, just doing the mundane, uh, but I don't have a problem doing, uh, you know, CNC. There was a time where, and I think a lot of us, you know, we didn't really want to do a lot of CNC, but now I appreciate that. You know, as you get a little older, so man, you know, I don't have a problem seeing my little old ladies, uh, I like the socialization of that. So I just think the military has helped me become a better uh, person who can pivot, um, hopefully seamlessly or you know, or least easily, and then keep moving. Keep your head down and keep moving. Excellent. And we had a, a young lady who was getting ready to start her residency program. Uh, and we had a residency uh, powwow a, a couple of weeks ago and it's it's, it's also uh, uploaded to our YouTube page here in, in uh, for Patry NMA and she's getting ready to start her career in the Air Force as a resident what advice would you give to her or anyone else who's considering military whether it be undergrad whether they've been Patry school or whether they are a resident or have maybe even in private practice and looking to change avenues what would you say to them well, I think I think it's it's a tremendous opportunity for her, and I think she should embrace that opportunity. Um, you know, despite all the things that we've seen and heard, there, there's no greater good that you can do as an American than to serve. And I think that the the benefits of that, as far as um, uh, being able to tell folk if you have any political at, uh, aspirations. It's always good to have checked that box off, but for her going into the Air Force, and the Air Force has uh, some of the best medical centers, so she'll have an opportunity to hopefully be exposed to some of the most high-tech um, and demanding um, uh, aspects of uh, what I would consider lower extremity surgery. Because like you said before, um, she more than likely will creep above the ankle. Um, There'll be times where she's going to have to to do um, uh, 
you know, decompressions of compartment syndrome. Um, if people are not going to say, oh, you can't go back. <laughs> no, you, you're going to have to take care of business. Um, I think the other thing, too, is really take advantage of all of the ancillary programs, the, the ATLS, you know, get ATLS certified, all of the different things. And the Army will give you that opportunity to get extra training. If you want to get your certification in hyperbaric oxygen, you'll have that opportunity. Take advantage. And then, like I said, you know, be on a mission to get your cases, uh, learn to collaborate with other podiatrists and orthopedic surgeons and make friends with the orthopedic surgeons there because it's a different dynamics in the military. You're not competitors. You're teammates trying to get the mission taken care of. So they don't care if you if you can see these patients, they're going to love you to death because you're going to take a lot of work off of them. Mm. Uh, another thing I think folks should know about Dr. Glover, that he's good friends with past president of the National Medical Association, Dr. Leon McDougall, who was past president, I believe, two, three cycles ago. Tell us about your relationship with Dr. McDougall, how you are hooked up through the military and, and, and continue your friendship from there. Well, uh, it, it was pretty funny. Uh, we went to uh, officer indoctrination in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and that's when I first met him. He had just uh, graduated from, um, uh, well, actually just finished his residency at Ohio State uh, in family practice. But we were uh, at uh, Newport together. And then later on, we hooked up together uh, when he was at uh, uh, Paris Island. And then he came out to Camp Pendleton. So we kind of knew each other at different stages. And Dr. McDougall had the opportunity to go to uh, Somalia uh, when they had the, uh, I guess, the Black Hawk Down uh, era when the United States went in and he was part of the medical attache. And I'll never forget, I said, well, how was it, you know, you know, Mac, you know, and, and he said, man, you know, a couple of brothers, we were marching and, and they were getting more more heat from the crowd than, than the other folk. But he has always been a, a guy who has always tried to help. He's been, a, uh, I, I think, an advocate of podiatry. Uh, he, you know, he's always pushed that when he's been department heads, when he was on, on active duty. And he's continued that now that he's Ohio State. I know he has done a lot of things with uh, the big uh, pediatric residency at Ohio State. So uh, Leon is a is a hell of a friend and uh, someone I you know always reach out to. See, through, through the military, uh, I'm it's been my experience as well as well as as Al and a lot of us is that we make these connections inside and outside of podiatrists, out, outside of podiatry, and what like Dr. McDougall and a lot of other uh, specialties in medicines they see what we do they they see what we ha bring to the table. And, and they, they appreciate our skill level and put us in positions where we can do things. And that transitions into uh, civilian life. Uh, Dr. McDougall was one of the ones when we transitioned from the National Podiatric Medical Association to the Podiatric Medicine section of the NMA. He was one of our advocates. We weren't widely accepted at first, some six, seven years ago, when uh, the old heads were like, why, why do we need podiatrists in, in here with the MDs, right? But he was one of the ones that helped push and move things along. And he ended up becoming president with the entire podiatry section support, right? And so we, we, you make lifelong connections, like he was saying. Al, I want to thank you, man. First of all, thank you for your service, brother. All right, appreciate you. 06 to you, for those who don't know. If you know, you know. All right. And I will see you in a few weeks uh, down in New Orleans for our national convention. If uh, for those who are watching, uh, if you haven't uh, registered for the convention, you can still do so. Uh, Dr. Glover's contact information will be in the description of this video. If you have questions about the military, whether you're leaning toward it or you've already uh, signed on the dotted line to, to go uh, work for Uncle Sam. You need to talk to this guy. You need to talk to this brother. He's going to give you 
the straight information about it, what you need to do, what you need to look out for. He's a good guy to know. I've known him for a long time. He's a good friend. He's a good frat brother, and he's a fantastic doctor and teacher. So check out for his uh, information. The information for joining us in the NMA will also be uh, linked in the description of this video. Thank you very much, and stay tuned for our next program. Peace out.